The more skills you can get together and bring to the table in this era, I think the better. You know, like having all those skills to bring to the table besides just playing drums. So the more things you can bring, if you can engineer, write, and produce, and all that, man, you know, it will help you survive, I think, you know. Sean, thank you so much for coming by. SNL comes on Saturday Night Live. I see you driving this band consistently every freaking night. Fantastic, man. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, man, I'm honored to be here. Thanks so much for having me, man. We're, I mean, you have played with the greatest musicians in the industry in what you're doing. I mean, what, what an incredible career you are having. Tell me about how music first entered your life to get involved in playing drums. I grew up in like kind of Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, mostly in Missouri, and my mom was a teacher. Uh, we were at a small town about 50 miles east of Kansas City, it's called Warrensburg. And uh, luckily, there was like one of those state, you know, colleges there in, in this town. Yeah. It was sort of in the middle of a cornfield, but you know, there was a school there that my mom taught at, and then they had a music program. So, you know, going to school, there a grade school there, and coming up, you know, at that time, that would have been mid to late 70s, if you were, you know, going to school, you almost had to take music. It was a required thing yeah, back then, yeah. you know. Here in the U.S., you know, if you come up that way and if you show passion for it and are interested, like, you know, there's like the jazz band program and yeah. different things like that. Yeah. A really lucky, you know, around that time, too, they had like the Stan Kenton camps and stuff, and they came to like Springfield, Missouri, and I remember, you know, being in the jazz band sort of in school and then being able to go to, my mother was always supportive because she saw that I was, you know, very passionate about it. You know, in Springfield, the Springfield, Missouri, they had one of the Kenton camps. I got to go to a couple of those. You know, I remember Dave Weckl, he was from St. Louis. Yes. And him being at one of those when I was, you know, I was younger. And, <laughs> and uh, Gary Hobbs, a great drummer that played with Stan Kenton at the time, yes. was running it. And uh, I remember Gary saying to us all, wow, this guy's really going to be, you know, so special to about Dave, you know, and then of course he did, you know. But it was just so interesting having those opportunities and, you know, the exposure to that kind of thing and the, like the and Jamie Abersall jazz camps. The, you know, these are camps, just to me, you know, the Stan Kenton was a big band that Stan would put on these camps. Yes, right, and The fact right. that you were exposed to that. And Jamie Abersold, another phenomenal jazz saxophone player, yeah. who put these events on and you attended that too. Yeah, yeah. If you were into music, you know, in, in the States and you had these opportunities, like if you were, you know, it kind of led to being a part of the jazz band kind of thing and yeah. there was these other opportunities and it was just a great way to go learn. But what was really great for me also is that I started working at a really young age, like in bands and stuff. So by ninth grade, I think I joined the Sedalia Musicians Union in Missouri, you know, <laughs> and was in a band by then, you know, all through high school playing gigs and stuff. And I feel really fortunate about being able to pursue sort of the jazz interest and stuff, but then being rooted in surviving and making a living, mm. or not making a living back then, but you know, getting paid sort You're getting of, paid playing. money to play drums. This is incredible. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was really lucky with that. But you know, always really hungry uh, to learn and taking lessons there. Uh, they had a music department at the university, you know, and so that sort of led to the percussion thing and studying marimba and, you know, and, and uh, ended up going to Bloomington, Indiana, which yeah. was a great music program. You know, uh, Jeff Hamilton, Peter Erskine, and all Ab those guys. Jeff Hamilton, and Peter Erskine, yeah. Kenny Kenny Arnold. Arnold. Absolutely, he's a great, great guy. Yeah. yeah, and I went there as a jazz major, but I had to audition as a cons uh, classical percussionist to kind of get in, you know, and the mallet thing and timpani and everything. So it was interesting being at IU was such a lucky thing because Kenny was still there. Uh, he had already graduated, but uh, was starting his whole thing with uh, Mellencamp. And uh, they didn't have a drum set teacher at that time. So, uh, you know, I was sought out Kenny, hey, can I have lessons? And <laughs> followed him around and helped him set up his gear and just watched him play and just, wow, it was incredible inspiration. You know? Kenny is an amazing, dedicated, high energy, yeah, focused yeah. player. I did an interview with him, which is a fantastic interview to watch, yeah, but I mean, he really yeah. talks about how he drove himself. But you had the chance to be under his tutelage. That's fantastic. It was amazing. So it was wild that this balance of stuff, because like at, um, in the jazz program there at that time, it was a really cool window, like uh, Bob Hurst, this great bass player, played yeah. with Winton and then went on to do so much stuff. Yeah. He was there. Jim Beard, who plays with Steely Dan now, but has done things with Wayne Shorter and all these different people. He was there. And Chris Bode was there. We were like the same age. 
And so there was this little pocket of players that were like really on a high level and uh, being around that, you know, sort of all boats rise, you know, type of thing. And it just was a, to be in a rhythm section with those guys and play. And at that time too, I was able to go study with Alan Dawson. And so I I felt so fortunate to have such a wide range of stuff come in at me. You know, I didn't just, it wasn't just the jazz path or it wasn't just, you know, it was like, you know, there's Alan Dawson, which was so incredible. I mean, this guy taught Tony Williams. Yeah. And I was sitting there <laughs> with Alan for a couple summers. Now, was this in, in the Boston area? Yeah, he taught out of his house in Lexington at that yeah. time. You know? So you made the move from there to Boston? Well, I would go to school, you know, uh, and in the summers, an ex-girlfriend's brother-in-law's father lived in that area, <laughs> and I was able to, like, go and do all his house chores and mow the yard and take care of the house and, and stay in the basement and then go study with Alan. You know, yeah. well, you know I'll tell you something. These, first of all, these names that you're mentioning, this is exactly what I want with this interview series. These names that you're mentioning, Chris Bode, this is a fantastic trumpet player who yeah, really yeah. is a skilled, the fact that you were at that time with him, all the names you mentioned, the Jeff Hamiltons, the Peter Erskins, these are all names to research to find out who they are, Stan Kenton. Yeah, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is very, very important to have this information of what was influencing you. Well, it was such a broad range, you know, from like an Alan Dawson influence to then like Kenny, who was just starting to break with this, with Jack and Diane and all the huge success with Mellencamp, you yeah. know. Just being around him was so inspiring and learning and the, and the physicality of how, how he played, and at that time, you know, everybody, it was like people were moving towards a, a physical playing, you know, like on the radio, like the snare drum was mixed louder than anything, you know. Yeah. At the same time, I was still gigging. There was a band there that we had that, Crystal Tolifero, you must know her, the yes. percussionist with Billy Joel. So yes, percussionist, was, yeah, so also she sings, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was in this band with us in Bloomington with a band called Kilo. And then Jeff Jacobs, who was a great piano player, played with Billy Joel for a while, yeah. was in the band. And uh, then Everett Bradley was later in the band, who was at Springsteen now. Holy jeez. So it was just wild, this like <laughs> pocket of time, you know. Seemed, looking back, seems really magical yeah. and extremely fortunate to be around. Yeah. But the broad range of influences and styles I had to deal with, I think really helped later survive, you know, mm. in New York and stuff. As far as, you know, sessions and different things like that. You yeah. know. To be able to play brushes and then turn around and smash drums and break them and it, you know, or you know Absolutely. what I mean. Like, um, well, just listen, the, the amount of artists that you're playing with, I mean, you know, Cheryl Crow to, to, to Billy Joel to Pink to Shakira to Kelly Clarkson to Pavarotti to Carly Simon, Richie Havens, Ray Charles. This is, that's a wide variety of information that you need to have. So this, it seems like you were prepared for this. Yeah, really fortunate, but always really hungry to learn in different styles and you know, just love music so much. Yeah. So w where did Saturday Night Live come in? You make a move down to New York? Yeah, so uh, hanging out with Kenny there, studying with him and following him around and helping him set up stuff and, and just watching and soaking it all in. And then there was an artist, this guy John Eddy, who was sort of a Springsteen esque artist on Columbia at the time, was at Mellencamp Studio making a record. This was right. in the late 80s. Records done, you know, used Kenny and, and the, the Mellencamp team. When they started the tour, you know, Kenny couldn't do the tour. He said, hey man, you know, I have a student who can do it. So actually was able to move out east with a gig, you know, to New York and the New Jersey nice. area, nice. which was so fortunate to be able to come out here with, with a, a gig, you know. And so that happened for about a year and a half and it started to fall apart, you know, got dropped from Columbia, got picked up by Electra, saw a record go down with that. And we all made a record up in Woodstock, uh, at Bearsville. Yeah. Then that label deal uh, imploded and so forced me to sort of have to start freelancing and all that, you know. The word of mouth freelancing thing in New York is what led to the audition for SNL, you know, mm. and that was in the early 90s. But it was interesting being a part of the major label thing and a band that was signed and seen everything sort of fall apart with that and then, you know, being thrust into the sink or swim sort of freelance community yeah. and, and that whole thing. And that led to playing a lot at the bitter end, doing a lot of blues gigs, uh, singer-songwriter gigs, just yeah. any, saying yes to anything, you know, just to survive, you know. So here you are now playing all different types of music. Yeah. You're kind of mapping out your career as far as where you want to go with this here. And then the audition comes up for Saturday Night Live. Yeah. You know, it was down at SIR, and G was running the band, G. Smith, uh, G. E. Smith uh, was running the band at that time. No heads up about what we were going to do or any of that, and he would sort of start playing, and you just had played along and made it happen or not, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but the audition went great, because it was sort of like uh, in-your-face blues rock, you know, and I think what he wanted was something with energy and kind of in-your-face but simple, you know. 
and but with a great feel, hope, you know, yeah, yeah that's what yeah. he was looking for, I think. And I think it helped that it was a young, uh, you know, was someone that would take direction and could do that, you know, I think he was looking for that as well. Yeah. Wow, you know, I remember the audition, like, I walked out of the thing, and wow, that, that felt really good, you know, there was a chemistry there. And, and now, did, so, so you were prepared for it? Kind of from just gigging, yeah, uh, from uh, having you know, a lot of experience. and doing uh, tons of blues gigs, and sort of then just stylistically, I think, where I was coming from in that context, simple but trying to make the wall sweat with how great it felt, yeah. and then with a lot of commitment. So, so were you, who, who were you listening to as you're going through college and, and in this preparation time? You were taking lessons, percussion lessons, you know, candy. What music were you listening to? Well, it was such a wide range of influences because on the jazz side, which I loved, you know, there I just, you know, from uh, Billy Higgins to Tony Williams to Roy Haynes to, uh, you know, all the all the Elvin, all the yeah. cats, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then here on this other side was like hanging with Kenny and seeing him playing really simple language, but really feeling great and with a huge physical presence, you know. Yeah. So there was that, and then the band I was in sort of played like R&B dance music of the time, so like Janet Jackson, Michael Jackson, Joey Watley, all this kind of stuff that was like really pocket orientated dance music. Mm. And it was in the 80s where, you know, there were sequencers and a lot of different things happening. Sometimes when we gigged, there were some tracks that were, you know, we were playing sequences, and I think all that stuff really helped solidify, center my time, you know, and my yeah. feel. But all of us were way into listening, you know, to all the classic Blue Note records, you know, on one hand, but then mm -hmm. totally like checking out what was on the radio and what was happening. So it wasn't like just the jazz thing with blinders or just the rock thing, it was like really a wide palette. But it's amazing how that has prepared you for what you're doing now. Yeah, really lucky, yeah, man. I mean, it, it's amazing. And, and with the show itself, Saturday Night Live, it, you know, this is doing live television. What's that like doing live television at that point where you're really on it for that time it's got to be exact yeah yeah it's interesting you know when the camera's on and there's no it's live tv and there's no redo it's you know i've had to spend a lot of time sort of working on self-confidence sort of or believing in yourself you know yeah. and that's a big part of being a drummer and, yeah. and the whole thing and i remember being at iu there was this trumpet teacher this guy bill adam this famous trumpet teacher and he had all the trumpet players, like especially like the lead trumpets, like they had to read this book. It was called Psycho Cybernetics. It just, it's sort of a self image psychology yes, thing about yes, believing yes. in yourself. But you know, the pressure of playing lead trumpet and not cracking a note and, right. and all of that. And then I remember reading that as well because I'd heard all, everybody talking about it, you know. And, but that kind of stuff really paid off that, you know, drumming is such an interesting dance between a huge sense of confidence and then also a huge sense of flexibility and being able to take direction. Anyway, so those kind of things, I've, it, I've spent a lot of time just trying to build an inner spirit for that situation, you know, because like live TV is, you know, we've done things where like say Martin Short is running around the studio and he'll drop a line and I mean, it can really be a stressful like give and take about, you know, you can't hear the band and he's 90 yards away and, but the, we've got to keep this together and. You gotta be flexible. Yeah. You yeah. have to really be flexible. I mean, it's, it's funny talking about these type of situations. Like I remember uh, something for Anton once on Letterman. It's such an interesting thing because it was such a working unit of cats for so many years. Yeah. And you come in and sub, you know, and the drumming thing is kind of a hot seat. But I remember Paul turned around saying, three, four. And like usually he would say what was happening, but there was no heads up. But, and, and I remember thinking, oh my God, is this a shuffle? Is it straight eighth, you know? And so I just played big quarter notes, you know? <laughs> and it ended up working out, but it was just a, it's live and you don't know what's happening and here's a count off, but let's go and let's blow it up and make it happen, you know, Boy, like the, that kind of. With that preparation, well, it's just that you talk about self-confidence because this is a very important topic that many musicians don't have. That's an ingredient that you researched and became aware of it that you wanted to have that. We don't want to be overconfident, but we want to believe in what we can do. But again, we have to expect the unexpected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a count off, you have no idea what feel or what song. You got to know how to kind of ease into it. Yeah. And playing quarter notes was exactly exactly what you should have done. It was beautiful. Right, because I didn't know if it was going to be a shuffle or an eighth note bass or, or whatever, you know. So, but yeah, this dance as a drummer, like, this is my house. And, this, you know, like they, they say with, with Al Jackson or Buddy Rich that if you ever ask them if it was too fast or too slow or question their tempo or something, that they'd kick your ass almost, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus, like, I remember reading, like, an article with Ben Riley, like, he was talking about playing with Monk and that, it was flexible who would maybe count something off or who did this. You know, it was like a family thing and a give and take. And so it's interesting between those two extremes and as a drummer, 
having an instinct for when they want you to take charge of a situation as a drummer yeah. and when you really need to let go and sit in what's happening and ease into a situation. You know, yeah. can, and it can be strong in, within one song, strong in a chorus and letting go in a verse and letting, or, you know, and falling into, it's just so interesting how many ways it can go, you know. But this is a great, this is a great study because this is really what it takes to be this flexible and this on top of it and this aware all the time that you have to know how to balance when to lead and when to follow. Yeah. Is really what it comes down to. Yeah, and it's wild, like, you know, like these house band gig type things, like I've been lucky enough to do this Songwriters Hall of Fame. Right. Thing. And um, so, you know, w one year it was Aerosmith and it's like, man, these are classic iconic tracks and as a drummer and then walking in and Steven Tyler's kind of a drummer too. Uh, yeah. And you know, you have like 30 seconds or 15 to make a really strong impression. Like, <laughs> I've got this, this, is, we're gonna, this is gonna be great, we're gonna kill it. <laughs> or oh, how's it go again? Or, you know, and then that sort of leads to like, Doing homework and preparation and Absolutely. you know putting in the time to to be able to kill it when you had to kill it you know what kind of preparation do you do when you this? well it's wild you know when you have to go in and and do something like thirty songs I mean you know I have a whole like kind of system that deals with the form of a song like even like with the Letterman thing like they would do let's say dude look like a lady you know it's like dude looks like a lady and then. You know, maybe you so, say, oh yeah, I know that, okay, let's jam. You know, but like the bridge is like a, a, an odd phrase and there's a break here and this, you know, and, and so those kind of details having like sort of, and there wasn't really a drum book there. So, you know, it was a lot of homework, like sort of putting it together quick form charts, like what's the basic beat, if there were some signature fills, you know, where, if there's a break and then a uh, red highlighter, stop playing there or you'll be fired. <laughs> or you know what I mean? Like, you, I do have a, a system that's helped me you know, with just a form type thing. And, and so do you chart things around. out? I do, but sort of when I have to like be responsible for that kind of stuff, like 25 songs and, right. a, you know. So yeah, I'll have a thing and try to put it where it's, it's a little bit not obvious or clipped onto the bass drum yeah. or, you know, whatever it takes to survive. Yeah, in the well, field. That's, a, that's, a, that's great advice. But it's sort of a shorthand thing that works for me, you know. But I think having tools, having that ability ha has really helped me survive, you know. Mm in those kind of situations, yeah. So you do, you, you have like a shorthand, but you, but you also, some things you might, you might become more longhand. Yeah, uh, if they're you important. Might become, you articulate know. certain things. Yeah, yeah, I've been looking enough, we've done this uh, thing last couple springs, uh, double drumming with Steve Gadd. Yeah. And man, that's been a real thrill, and we'll, you know, like some of these songs, like, um, maybe it was Barracuda with Heart, you know, and then there's some signature feels, fills from the record that, it was really great for us to just nail them together, you know. Yeah. And uh, he was into it, we were into it. So, you know, having the ability to transcribe that kind of thing and put it in there and, yeah. you know, be consistent with it and said, oh, I hope, hopefully I remember that. You know, because if you're 35 songs into something, you know, it's tough to remember everything. Yeah. So anyway, having those kind of tools is really helpful, you know. Boy, that's fantastic. Dude, what kind of, how do you organize the business side of what you do? How, how, do, you, how do you balance all this here? Yeah, you know, the business thing is so interesting. I, th I think there's an art to being able to handle a freelance career, you know. Mm. It's always a dance, it it's never ends, trying to understand what something should pay or is paying. And it's interesting, you know, with the recording thing, when something's based on just the union scale rates, it's almost like, well, here's a rate that is already there and, and, and stuff, you know. But when you have to navigate the thing for yourself and, yeah. you know, is it per hour or, but then if somebody comes in and, you do five tracks in the hour, and you only got, you know, did an hourly rate, then did you shoot yourself in the foot for yeah. art being good and getting yeah, five things right away, totally. you know. But that, that, that's part of the balance of it. So you, you, you handle it all, you email back to people, you're on top of what's happening, you're controlling it all. Yeah, and I think being able, you know, to communicate and put yourself in the other person's shoes, yeah. have empathy and compassion for the big picture. Yeah. Because money is, is, is complicated, and I, I know, you know, it's easy. Some people just shut down and can't, you know. Can't deal with it, yeah. But it's a jungle out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's for sure. Well, the jungle of New York City, you're handling it very well. You're in the heart of Jumanji over here, and you are doing fantastic with it by playing consistently. I mean, listen, you're doing dates with Gad. I mean, it doesn't get any deeper than that when you think about, yeah, wow. you know, maybe where you came from to where you are right now. Oh, yeah, incredible. It's pretty yeah. amazing, right? Uh, and what a learning experience just to be in the room with him, you know, and around him, and not only how he plays, but how he deals with people and input and yeah. just sitting and listening. 
taking things in. What an inspiration to be around. You know, Absolutely. To see. It and it's rare for drummers to be around other drummers Absolutely. in a working totally. situation to see that. Yeah, but yeah. You, you have so many artists that you played with. Is there anything that stands out with any, any one artist that was a, were lessons that you might have learned by playing with that artist? There's, there was these crazy gigs that uh, were in Italy, and uh, Phil Ramone, the great producer, was yeah. in charge. And um, Steve was doing it for a while, and then I think he had to go on the road with uh, uh, Clapton or somebody. And so it was Pavarotti with all these pop stars, you know. And it would always be this, you know, it would be Clapton and then Bono from U2, and then I, it was just incredible, you know. But it was trippy, you know, because they'd do like an opera song with Pavo, and then Pavo would do a pop song with it. <laughs> but once James Brown was there, you know. And so uh, James had brought his own band, but then we'd sort of rehearsed with the orchestra, and there was this whole thing on It's a Man's World. But uh, James made us audition for him to, to, to do the thing, really? you know. And so that was just kind of fun, you know, and, and it, it all worked out. But just being around James and playing with him and, and, and all these things, I mean, I pinch myself thinking about all the people, you know, to, yeah, to yeah. record with and stuff. Yeah. You know? yeah. And how, with, with Saturday Night Live, the, 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 the band itself, the, the core band, is just a phenomenal group of musicians. Yeah. That, 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 that Lorne Michaels put together. Yeah, it's amazing. Lenny Pickett runs the band now. I mean, Jesus, what an incredible musician, you know, from Tower of Power, the Absolutely. tenor player. Wow, such an inspiration to be around and, you know, hear stories about Garibaldi and all this stuff, you know, and, yeah. and practicing on a little pad the size of a quarter. Yeah. And, um, you know, and James Genus plays bass, um, who plays with Herbie Hancock, now he's played with the Brecker Brothers, everybody. And Steve Touré on trombone, yeah. Alex Hank. Ron Blake. I mean, the, the band is really uh, an inspiration to play with. Are you listening to anybody in particular now that, uh, that inspires you? You know, I think, man, there's a lot of great musicians coming up. You know, uh, when Keith was here in New York, I, it was so inspiring to see him play, you know. And, um, you know, this town is great, such great drummers uh, like, you know, JoJo and Keith and Jojo Mark Meyer Giuliano. And and Mark Giuliano. Yeah, These guys man, are just fantastic, insane, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Being able to go see Purdy play in a club yeah. uh, is just, just incredibly inspiring for me. Or go to see Charlie Durain play and then, you know, see Steve Jordan and all these cats that are here in town and be yeah. able to go to the club and see all the jazz cats, uh, it's a wonderland, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man. It really is. You know, there are so many, all these names that you're mentioning, what I like about it is that this, this next generation that watches this and listens to these interviews, when they hear these names that you're mentioning, you know, it's very important for them to do the research of who they were. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. When you mention some of the jazz guys that, you, that you've mentioned, you know, that, that's, that's an important part to study as it is to understand Gad and Steve Jordan and what these guys have done in, in their career and continue to do. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, man. it's very, very important. In closing, what would you say to this next generation that, that is listening and they're fans of yours, they, they're watching your career, they watch you on TV on Saturday night and they just see you, you cutting this band and driving this band. What advice would you give them, Sean, to this next generation? Yeah, well, the music business is not easy. <laughs> and it's wild because I think, you know, there's sort of a thing like, well, if I go to school and go to music school and, maybe, and I graduate, well, I'm going to get a gig, right? You know, and then that's, it couldn't be further from the truth about yeah. it. So I feel like, you know, I, that phrase that people say sometimes that, man, only do the music thing if, if you absolutely have to, in your heart, it, it's, it's everything to you and you can't almost imagine doing anything else, you mm -hmm. know. I remember being 29 before, before I got to Gate SNL. And I was driving around and doing blues gigs, and I was happy and I was playing, but I started to realize, you know, I'll never be able to afford health insurance. I'm never gonna, you know, and like I, you know, I've been with the same woman, Elaine, um, I'm a better half for like 25 years, so really lucky, but like I've never figured out how in this business to have the stability, let's say, to like to have a family or the children, because the, the business is so tenuous, yeah, you know, yeah, like it can yeah. follow, like at SNL, when it ends every season, we never know if we're gonna be back again, you know. You know, and I'd been through the thing sleeping on the floor with five cats eating tuna fish out of a can. Just did the survival rock yeah. band thing and getting in a van and doing gigs. Yeah. But I knew in my heart that it was what I was 100% in my DNA. Like, I, mm. I'm a musician no matter what was going to happen. It's all I knew, wanted to do or could do, could see myself doing. When people say that about a, music, a career in music, like, if you can imagine doing anything else, maybe do it. Yeah. Which I think is interesting about how hard core it can be to survive year after year, stitch a career together for decades and survive, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. Then having a belief in yourself and to keep going, uh, but it has to be something that you have to feel like you have to do, you mm -hmm. know. 
The other thing would be the more skills you can get together and bring to the table in this era, I think the better. You know, like, like I was able to put a studio together in my apartment and when the studio started closing in New York, I mean, that really helped pay the mortgage as far as, you know, surviving in that way. To be able to sort of program and pull the loop thing together and, and maybe, you know, I've been lucky to get some writing on some shows and different things. Nice. Having all those skills to bring to the table besides just playing drums, mm -hmm. I think really they will help in this era too, you know. So the more things you can bring, if you can engineer, and write and produce and all of that, man, you know, it will help you survive, I think, you know. Wow, yeah. this is great advice to have the diversity of being able to have, you know, maybe diverse incomes within the music industry. Yes. But you talked about that as being a calling. I really believe that you really had this calling that you had to do this. Yeah. And in your life, it seemed like fate just led you to people that were gonna constantly keep building your confidence and your talent and your ability, that you are where you are because you followed your heart, you followed your instinct, and you followed your passion. Yeah, yeah, and that, that phrase about the harder you work, the luckier you get, you know, yeah. I think there's something to, to all that, you know. If it feels like a calling, you know, to be in the music business just because I want to get famous or rich or something like that, I think yeah. that's, that's the, um, it has to, you have to feel like this is what I am. Yeah. That, you know? To feel that this is what I am. Well, it for sure has been proven with what you're doing, Sean, oh, man, in yeah. all that you do. And I thank you so much on behalf of the Sessions panel here. Hey, thank you. Fantastic. Good luck, good luck. Thank yeah, you so much. Right